Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I asked if the lights could be dimmed for you all. Um, I'm conscious I'm following lunch, so there may be a few who wish to doze off at the back. The last time, last time I was at Bristol Colson Hall, I came here to see Motorhead. I think that probably dates me somewhat. Um, I'll try and do two things for you today. I'll try to be as interesting as that Motorhead concert was for me 20 years ago. And secondly, I'll try to be a bit quieter than they were. I'm going to talk about what happens at Port and Down. I'm sure some of you have heard of Port and Down. Let's bust the myth first. 1963. There's a young man here looking at me and say, thinking, is that when you started at the Ministry of Defence? No, 1963. Science and technology. Let's think about science and technology worldwide, 1963. Science and technology around the world was driven by two principal factors, the space race and the Cold War. Space and defence were the principal things that stimulated technological development. Here in the United Kingdom, the Ministry of Defence spent six times as much, six times as much as the rest of government put together on science and technology. And Porton Down was one of the government's top secret laboratories. Science and technology driven by the needs of government and conducted by the top secret laboratories of the government. Now I'm not going to tell you about the top secret work that we do. Shame, you all say. Because the world has changed. The world is very, very different today. The drivers are not space and defence. The drivers are my son and daughter as consumers of technology driving the market. It's the market that drives technology, not my needs. The Ministry of Defence does not spend six times as much as the rest of government put together. It spends one-sixth of the government's departmental spend. It spends one-twentieth of the government's whole spend. We're a significant player, but we no longer lead the race. And let's think about that in a wider context. The UK government invests £10 billion a year in science and technology. Sounds quite a lot. Microsoft invests 9.7 billion. One company spends as much as the British government on science and technology. That gives us a very, very different world in which we live. So let's think about that world from my perspective, from defence and security. A strong Britain in an uncertain world. I'm sure some of you recognise those words, the strapline of the 2010 national security strategy. Taking that into its two parts, a strong Britain. We've always been a major player on the international stage in both defence and wider security interests. Um, we are the only country on this planet who is a member of the permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, a member of NATO, the EU, the G8 and the Commonwealth. We are a big player and we said very clearly in 2010, we will not retreat to Ireland, Britain. We will play on the world stage. Very important. But that second piece in an uncertain world, I think that sets the background really for my talk about science and technology. Because when, when we wrote the National Security Strategy 2010, I think there were, there were few of us who would have thought that a fruit seller in Tunis frustrated by his inability to get his goods to market, would set in train events that would lead to the overthrow of governments that had been in place for decades. If I think back to the time I started with the Ministry of Defence, I think few of us would have thought about the world we are now in. Just, just 10 years ago, would we have seen that today in 2013 we would still be in Afghanistan? Would we envisage a world in which America is shifting her focus from being the world's policeman and looking at the Middle East and North Africa to looking at the Pacific Rim instead. It's an ever-changing world, and that's true very much for national security, directly for national security. Let's think about the tier one risks that we talked about in the national security strategy. The top three we published in 2010, counter-terrorism, before the death of bin Laden. Number two, cyber before big state-sponsored cyber attacks on um, state-led infrastructure around the world. Um, 
And number three, international conflict in which the UK becomes involved before our interventions in North Africa following that Arab Spring. So we're in a world of change. We've been through years of change and the only thing I guess we can say about that change is that it will, it will continue. And within the Ministry of Defence we have a futures looking unit and they describe the era out to 2040 will be a time of transition will be a time of transition and this is likely to be characterized by instability and technology plays into that change it plays into that change very strongly but let me let me focus in on that technology strand the first thing i think about when i think about science and technology and how it affects our aspirations in defense in wider national security is its importance when I, was a, when I was a boy and I joined the Ministry of Defence, at the end of every year, the most senior officials in the Ministry of Defence would say to the people who drove the aeroplanes, you're doing a great job, we like what you do. And the people who drove the tanks, you're fantastic, we really value you. And then they would say to me, what has science and technology ever done for me? Anyone who watches Monty Python, what have the Romans ever done for me? And we always had to invent the stories of how wonderful our science and technology was and why it mattered to defence and security. Not today. It's not just the technology. It's the all-pervasive, ubiquitous nature of that technology which puts technology at the forefront of our defence and security efforts. Not just for our capability to keep the citizens of this country safe, to provide our armed forces with world-leading capabilities in, in the field, and in the theatre and the very difficult jobs that they do. Also for our adversaries, who don't have the same constraints as us, who are happy to harness science and technology in new and different ways, to plan their attacks, to communicate with each other, to defeat our airport security devices, to further their own ends. That technology is all pervasive now, so much so that the last policy paper we published from the Ministry of Defence originally was titled Equipment, Support and Technology for UK Defence and Security. Equipment, Support and Technology. When we published the paper, technology wasn't at the end. It became national security through technology. For the first time in my working life, national security through technology. Technology front and centre. But we need to think about the provenance of that technology. Because as I said earlier, we no longer drive it. We don't drive it from the needs of government. It's driven by the consumer marketplace. That means it evolves in ways that we don't understand or we can't predict. It means it's influenced by different factors. It goes in directions that we may not anticipate. So we need to always be looking ahead and thinking about that technology in the wider sense and then thinking about how, how we harness it. And I'll talk about some of how we do that and what that means for us at Port and Down. Um, and in the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. But let, let's, let's give an example of this ubiquitous technology. Um, actually, w when I came here this morning, I was driving down and I'd been told in preparation, you've got 30 minutes, a 20 minute speech, and 10 minutes for Q&A. And when I got here, I was badged up as 45 minutes. So I've got to fill my extra 10 minutes so I can either regale you with my motorhead story some more or give you some examples. Big data. Every government department is thinking about big data. What does it mean? What does big data mean? My favourite definition is big data is when you find things out about you that you didn't say, it's what others said. That's my favourite definition. And this is because Tesco's and other retail outlets have more information on our shopping habits than my wife has on mine. Um, it's because my children's presence on the internet through Twitter, tweet, instant messaging tells people out there more about my family life than perhaps I would wish to reveal. But some figures, some numbers. 2.5 times 10 to the 18 bytes of information. I'm a mathematician, hands up. That means something to me. It probably means very little to you unless you're a mathematician. 2.5 times 10 to the 18 bytes of information is the sum of human knowledge from the dawn of time until 1987. The sum of human knowledge from the dawn of time until 1987. 2.5 times 10 to the 18 bytes of information is the amount of data generated every single day today. That's big data. 
The difference is from the dawn of time until 1987, it was Dickens and Chaucer, and it was Darwin and Einstein, and it furthered human evolution. Today, it's me looking at the British Lion selections for this weekend's third test. Totally, totally different data, huge volumes, but how do we sift out the important? That's the ubiquity of data. But the computing technology has kept up with that data. We don't talk about the cloud that often at the moment. It was one of those things that kind of became a buzzword in about 2008, 2009. And now most people don't really know what it means. Let, let's just talk a little bit about the cloud. Um, I'm so old that um, with my kids, I used to watch the X Factor. Motorhead weren't on it. I used to watch the X Factor, and at the end of the X Factor, I'd make a telephone call on their behalf and say, I'm going to vote for Felicity. That was my telephone call. This year, a big American game show produced a clap app, prop number two, a clap app. So instead of phoning them up and saying, I want to vote for Felicity, at the end of Felicity's app, you hit your mobile phone and you clap. Boring old folk like me, clap. My kids go crazy. You can shake your phone as well. The phone doesn't transmit one vote. It transmits one vote per clap to the score system. OK, what's this got to do with cloud computing? This is the power of computing today. When that system was set up, five minutes before the game show, the cloud computing capability was using four computers. Four virtual computers were harnessed to power that application. At minute six, at the end of the first, app, uh, the first act, 762 computers were working in the cloud to process that application. The high point of the show, minute 23, 9,650 computers were working to process the data. The show closed. Within five minutes, we were back to four computers. And all of that happened without a single human intervention. The whole system, the cloud, just turned its magic on processing the amount of information it was given, dragging in resource on its own, given preconceived rules, to give enough computing power to solve the problem as it was getting bigger and then back off as it got smaller. It's got nothing to do with security, has it? Actually, we process large amounts of information, and our approach has always been if we need to process large amounts of information, we need a huge computer infrastructure, don't we? A huge capital spend. Not any longer. That changes the paradigm not just for us, because that means that folk out there who want to access that information for good intentions or otherwise also don't need to buy supercomputers. They can use cloud computing. You used to have to buy cloud computing by the day. Google changed it by, to by the hour, which fundamentally changed the business model. Immediately, Amazon changed their charging regime to by the second. So if you need five minutes of cloud computing power, you pay for five minutes. Suddenly, this is accessible to every individual around the world. Let's bring that a little bit closer to some of the things that really matter to us. What does it mean with all of this technology being out there, all of this technology emerging, all of this technology being available? What does that mean for defense and security? It means our job has fundamentally changed. It means the world in which we live has fundamentally changed because no longer are the people who invest the most in science and technology necessarily at the leading edge. So let me give you an example of that. Landlines in Africa for telephones, they don't exist. They bypass the traditional evolutionary route and telephony in Africa has gone straight to third generation mobile phones. Very, very rapidly, they're catching up with capability in other states. We call it in our circle sometimes the democratization of technology. What used to be the province of secret government laboratories is now freely available to all available around the world. And that narrows the gap. That narrows the gap between what we used to think of as the developed nations and those who we always thought as emerging. It means that the balance of the scientific edge is shifting. One of my favorite numbers, this, India produces more information and computing technology graduates every year than the United States produces graduates in every discipline combined. 
And that's a number that's bigger than the number of babies born in the United Kingdom every year. So who in 10, 15, 20 years' time will be at the leading edge of computational developments? Will it be the UK or Europe? Will it be the United States? Or will it be the emerging um, economies coming to the front? I think a lot of that really reflects back onto the change for our organisation. I mentioned 1963. Um, 1963, we employed around about 30,000 scientists in the Ministry of Defence. Today, in my organisation, the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, we employ about 3,500, a significantly different number. Why? Because the majority of that technology, have, as we've said, is developed outside. Our job is not to invent everything. Our job is to find it, to harness it, to access it, to employ it. Our job is to maximise the impact of that science and technology on the defence and security of the United Kingdom. So today, 50 years after DSTL was um, at Porton Down was a top secret government laboratory, today we are the innovation access point for the Ministry of Defence. In some niche areas, yes, we know that nobody else is inventing technology which will solve our needs. So in some niche specific areas, we do the technology ourselves, but the Ministry of Defence still invests half a billion pounds, a significant sum of money, in its science and technology research programme. And that half a billion pounds, 60% of it, is given to external providers, external suppliers, in industry, in academia, in international partners and allies. 60% of what we do is done outside. That's quite significant, and that gives us a, a very different job. What does it mean for the organisation itself? Well, firstly, we're no longer just based at places like Port and Down. Um, we're not um, a group of scientists who sit in laboratories um, developing the inventions of the future. We're out there across government. I talked about defence and security. Our staff are employed at military headquarters, um, military bases through the UK with the security and intelligence agencies. Over 20 of our staff today are in theatre in Afghanistan supporting frontline operations, giving scientific and technological advice, supporting the commander in his thinking, in his decision-making, in his analysis. So it means that we are outside of the organisation much more. Um, it means we're much closer to that wider supplier base. Let's think about the British academic base, arguably the best in the world, 1% of the world's population. That's what we are, 1% of the world's population. We output 8% of the world's research, 15% of the world's most cited, most looked to research. And we have more top 100 laboratories per head of population than any country in the UK. In DSTL, we have a large number, a large number of visiting professors from our organisation who sit in universities um, and spend time with researchers in universities. We have academics who come from universities and sit with us, keeping us at the forefront of where the three billion pounds of research money that is spent through the research councils in the United Kingdom is taking us, where the technologies are evolving at the exploratory level that will be the game changers of tomorrow. So when we talk about the academic debate in things like quantum phenomena, and quantum technology. All I know about quantum phenomena is it's described as the physics that nobody understands. Um, but where will that go when we do understand it? And how will that change the game when quantum computing either makes every code unbreakable or, depending who you believe, gives everybody an unbreakable code? What will that mean and how do we in government stay ahead of where that research is going in academia? And how do we harness it for our own needs? By being in conversation, by being in collaboration, by working collaboratively with academia. We sponsor nationally a series of PhDs right across the British research base. Over 20 different universities work very collaboratively with us in areas such as developing technologies in new materials, new and non-materials, which will provide armour and protection capability for our frontline forces, harnessing the British academic base. But we also work very, very closely with the industry base, um, that wide British and um, international industry base, because the British small and medium enterprise um, community 
is a, a community of vibrancy. Um, it's where the hot pot, the melting pot of ideas is formulated in the United Kingdom. I'll come back to this point at the end, but if any of you have walked upstairs, you will see a poster from the Department for Business. And it says, technology is great, Britain. It's an indication of our, our knowledge economy and the innovation in our small and medium enterprise community. And a large part of our job is to tap, to harness, to bring the innovations that are developed outside to the needs of defence and security. And we need to really understand what that innovation means. Because I think when people talk about innovations, they think about new ideas, new inventions, the bright light bulb moment that's the wonderful new piece of research that leads to a change. But it's not all driven by technology. I looked at my smartphone earlier. Um, again, I'm old enough to have an iPod. If you look at a, the original iPod, it's solid state memory, compression algorithms, technologically nothing new. It was the business model, the innovation in the business model that fundamentally revolutionized the music download industry. The revolution with these things was not when someone unplugged it from the wall so you could walk around with them. It was when someone looked at them and said, you know, we've had phones for 100 years and all we've ever done is talk on them. The use of the mobile phones in all the different environments. My kids tell me off if I phone them. It's great because my daughter's found a new social media thing called Kick. So she said, Dad, Dad, can I kick you? I don't think I would have got away with that 20 years ago. But that's the wider context of innovation. We also need to think how technology drives different changes and different innovations. Because we're in a world where the technology often is the driving force. It's not that societal needs change and the technology helps keep up with the societal needs. Often today, it's the other way around. I mentioned Arab Spring at the beginning. Think of the role of social media, developed for wholly different purposes, but the role of social media and the use of social media in spreading the inspirational message of hope that fueled to a large part events in the Middle East and North Africa just a few years ago. And the ubiquity of that technology that even in emerging and developing countries with no land telephone communications, as we said earlier, social media could still reach right across that aspirational society. I said I'd come back to wealth creation in my last few minutes. I guess for every single government department, the economy is front and centre of our thinking, whether we're thinking about the needs of um, DEFRA in the environment and food, or my needs in defence and national security. The Chief of Defence Staff, my ultimate military boss, um, said in a speech at RUSI, the, the biggest challenge, the biggest national security challenge facing the UK is economic, not military. But I want to use that just a little bit to think about another aspect of our role. Um, because it's changing, it's changing the way we work. I think of that economic challenge in two different ways. The first is austerity, and the second, prosperity. Being Welsh, I like words that sound like each other. Austerity and prosperity. Talking about the austerity agenda, if there are any scientists, any engineers, any technologists in the audience, you may be a member of the um, cross-government science and engineering community. And if you are, you may look at the recent cross-government newsletter. It's focused around something called Interlab. Interlab is a bringing together a collaboration between seven different laboratories representing five government departments. It's a collaboration that has gained huge amounts of pace over the last few years because of the austerity challenge. We all buy, we all use scientific equipment. Can we collaborate? Can we save money in doing so? We all try to solve scientific and technological problems for different reasons. But actually, if you think of the needs of DEFRA, what worries them right now? Ash Dieback, bovine TB. So they're interested in life sciences and diagnostics. What worries us? Chemical and biological defense in the news at the moment, life sciences and diagnostics. What worries the Home Office? We have a drink driving policy. We have no drug driving policy. Why? We can't do drug testing by the roadside. 
what would enable that? Life sciences and diagnostics, we all solve similar problems in different theatres, in different contexts, in different environments, but we all try to tackle those problems. Can we collaborate more effectively? The answer is yes, we can, yes, we are. If you read that newsletter at one point in it, a quote from a colleague of mine in DEFRA, what can a life scientist, a plant biologist, bring to tackling the improvised explosive device threat in Afghanistan? I'm not going to tell you the answer. My team are outside the door. As you go out, don't head towards the canteen. And don't go yet, because I haven't finished. Don't go right towards the canteens. Turn left. My team are there. If you come and talk to us afterwards, I'll tell you how that planned biologist helped us think about improvised explosive devices in Afghanistan. But it's not just about austerity. It's not just about working together, collaborating more effectively. That's exciting. It's good. It saves us money. That's one half of the equation, austerity. The other half of the equation is prosperity. I mentioned technology is Great Britain, the trading logo of the Department for Business now. They have two other big signs, knowledge is Great Britain, innovation is Great Britain. I've spent 25 minutes, I think, telling you my job is harnessing knowledge, harnessing innovation and exploiting it for defence and national security advantage. But if that technology and that innovation is in the wider supplier base and I can harness and exploit it and take their ideas and their innovations and their inventions to be products that help keep our boys and girls alive on the front line, how else can they use that to drive wealth creation? So we have a very, very important role, not just in protecting our people on the front line, in looking after the UK national security, but also in the wider economic agenda. And to the extent that having talked about bringing those innovations in, and we have a specific mechanism a, whose whole reason for being is to find ideas in the outside world when we're looking for video analytics, not the defence company who's inventing their own, but the makers of Shrek 3, the filmmakers who know more about video analytics than I ever do. How do we harness them and bring their ideas in? And we have our own mechanism, which goes the other way. We developed some world-leading science in plasma coatings. <gasps> a science word, what does it mean? Plasma coatings, ways of protecting material so that if we're in an environment um, with hazardous materials around, we can keep the hazardous materials from going through clothing. Actually, that's really interesting because you can use it for waterproofing. I'm on my third mobile phone. I dropped my first one in the bath and it blew up. We have an organisation called Ploughshare, which is the Ministry of Defence's wholly owned technology transfer organisation. Through Ploughshare, we took technology that we developed for defence purposes, and that is now being used to coat mobile phones and trainers. Obviously not my shoes. Um, mobile phones and trainers to keep them waterproof. If I'd been working with Ploughshare 10 years ago, I'd still be on my first mobile phone. But this is about using the technology that we developed for the wealth creation of the, of the United Kingdom. Um, I said at the beginning I'd talk for about 30 minutes and, and then give you some time to ask me some questions. I'm sure there's some things you'd like to know about the details of, of Port and Down. And my team and I will be outside at the end. But what I've tried to paint, I think, over the last 30 minutes is, is a world that's constantly changing, a national security environment which is always evolving, in which science and technology stand front and centre of our capability in the United Kingdom not only to keep our soldiers and airmen safe on the front line, but also to look after our national security interests. Where that technology is often um, developed outside and we bring it to the needs, the national needs, through the organisation now based at Port and Down. So in 1963, DSTL um, didn't exist. Port and Down was a top secret government laboratory. Today, DSTL, ironically, last year, won a National Government Award for Openness and Transparency. Fifty years ago, we wouldn't have applied because we wouldn't have been allowed to put our name to print. Last year, we won an award for Openness and Transparency. That's the evolution, that's the change, that's the development that we have had to go through. I think this conference is be exceptional. I think we are. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions you have or come and talk to us afterwards.
Do we have any questions? Yes, please, sir. Hi, um, I'm Lee Elliott Cartwright from the Met Office. Uh, you're talking about the uh, supply base being uh, the leaders in the development of the technology. Uh, to what extent in the current uh, uh, climate do you have difficulties in attracting and retaining the caliber of staff that you need? That, that's a very good question, and um, you may have heard David Willits. Da David Willits, as the science minister, talks about the STEAM community, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, um, and the UK needing to develop the right caliber of scientific technical people is the first point. And the second point, is everybody here a civil servant? We don't necessarily compete with industry on a competitive basis for salary. I can probably say that in this room. Um, Actually, we have great success in recruiting people, recruiting the brightest, the best um, graduates. Um, we haven't had difficulties getting the right people in. Um, sometimes our challenge is retaining those people. And that, that's an interesting evolution because, again, if I go back to 1963, anybody who walked through the doors at Port and Down, we didn't shackle them, but they stayed with us for life. And that's the way government science was. You joined a laboratory and 60 years later you walked out of pretty much the same laboratory. It's not like that today and people move around much, much more. Um, we've taken a very forward-leaning approach to that um, where we actively support people moving in and out of the organisation. We actively seek to bring people in further in their career. Um, we actively seek not just to recruit people. I said we're about 3,500 people at I'll get the numbers slightly wrong, but I think about 3,200 of those are permanent employees, and the other 600 or so are people on different forms of employment. Um, that might be short-term engagement with us, it might be secondments, it's a few hundred military staff who are engaged in our organisation as well. So we've deliberately tried to find new, different, innovative ways to have a flexible model. Um, the other thing that's really important in answer to that question is that the um, when we were inventing all of the technology, we knew which technology areas we had to keep going. Now it changes very quickly. So one day we might need people who are good at making red chairs, and next week actually the threat has changed, um, or the technology that we thought might mature has suddenly started to appear, and we need people who can make blue chairs. So we need to be much more um, agile in our access to our workforce. Um, and, and so, we, you know, we, we are working active collaboration, for example, across government laboratories on sharing staff and collaborating in virtual facilities, and that's things that we're exploring right now. We have people in universities and in our organisation from universities, as well as the traditional recruit um, and, and retain. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, I'm George Quintero from the Intellectual Property Office. Hi, George. Um, I was wondering whether you feel, after all the recent leaks um, from the NSA and GCHQ, whether the technology we're working on has been abused, can be abused. Um, I think that's a, an interesting and difficult question. Um, I'll, I'll answer it in a roundabout way, and then I'll come back and say no. Um, when most people think about cyber, and it's one of our top tier one challenges in the UK, what do you think about? You think about firewalls, and you think about networks. When I think about cyber, the, the word we've used in government circles, and this is in the open literature, is the insider threat. Okay, so we don't worry so much. We do worry about it, but we don't spend all our time worrying about people necessarily getting through our firewalls. We worry about people on the inside who already have access, who decide that they're going to do bad things. Um, that's not new. We've been looking at counter-espionage for many years. Um, in many of these cases, the technology has enabled people to take more information, but it's as much about the people as the technology. And so, yes, you can get a thumb drive onto which you can put lots of information, but if you had ill intent, um, you could still get key information. So I, from my perspective, it's not so much the technology um, that, 
is the cause of the problem. It's just that the proliferation of the technology has, um, if you like, exemplified the magnitude of what happens when it goes wrong. So is there more we can do, of course? And we have um, some wonderful work being done, um, not only in GCHQ and the Center for Protection of National Infrastructure, um, but also in the Cabinet Office, looking at cybersecurity for the UK. Um, again, not only for government, but for the um, wider business community. But from my perspective, in many cases, this is about the people as much as the technology. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? I think we can probably do another one. <coughs> no one's shouting at me. Otherwise, you can come and talk to us outside. Yeah, please. Hi, Will Jones, Cabinet Office. You were talking about how universities, uh, or the UK universities, are well regarded. Um, why is that? And do you think with the level, uh, I mean, you took, used India as an example in computer sciences, but it, this is going on throughout the world. How long do you think we can hold that position and can it be sustained? Uh, that's a really interesting question. How long will we remain at the forefront? And if I said it depends, um, you probably would think I'm ducking the question. It depends on the areas. It depends on certain um, technology areas. Let me look at India. Produces more information computing technology graduates per year than the US in all disciplines combined. Where do Indian first degree graduates go to study and read their PhDs? They go to two places. They go to America and they come to the UK. Okay. So part of the reason they have more is the demographics of the size of the population. But when they look for their excellent second degree, it's the United Kingdom and um, America that they go to. Um, I think, and it's not my place to comment on government policy about science funding, but we have ring-fenced that science funding um, and are continuing to keep pressure um, to maintain funding in science in the national security through technology um, strategy I talked about. Um, that explicitly states we will um, not reduce our science and technology funding below where we currently are through the term of this parliament. So I think the UK is taking a position of protecting that as much as possible. Um, it is true though that others are increasing their spending. My personal perspective, and this is not reflecting the views of the Ministry of Defence, if my boss is listening. Um, it's not so much about the academic base. We tend to be pretty, pretty good in the academic base. If I think of some of the areas I mentioned in my talk, communications, um, quantum phenomena, big data, um, universities in the United Kingdom are at the forefront. Where we're not at the forefront is exploiting that basic research into product. That's where we lag behind, and that's where the emerging economies um, when you look for your, your televisions, um, where are they made? Southeast Asia. And it's not any longer that these are first made in the United Kingdom or Western Europe, or indeed the US, and then copied and built in Southeast Asia. It's that the technology at the early stage is developed in the UK, the US, in Europe, but the exploitation of that and the turning of that to product and the taking of that to the market then happens elsewhere. And that's a direct link for me with the wealth creation agenda. And if we could do better at capitalising on the research base and finding ways to bring industry, academia and government together to take the, the early research and turn it into, um, into product, then that's great. And so, some of the things our colleague from the Intellectual Property Office um, will know far more about this than I. But we're changing the way we think about intellectual property and about how government can play in the role of that wealth creation, the translation from research to product. In fact, the last House of Commons um, cross-party review on defence technology was called Bridging the Valley of Death. And that's not about frontline operations, that's about taking very early technology to exploitation. And it's always been called the Valley of Death, that the early ideas never become products in the UK. How do we do that better? And it's not easy. Thank you. On that note, shall I allow you to either go and get your coffee or come and ask us about some of the really exciting things that we're, we're doing on the front line. Thank you. <laughs>